Good morning. As we're wrapping up our journey through the book of Jeremiah this morning, I'm going to kind of recap several things, but we're going to focus primarily on the fact that Christ never gives up on us, and he doesn't give up on the calling for us to reflect his image. To illustrate that, we're going to look at two kings primarily, and we're going to start by reading Jeremiah 52:33. So Chochokachin, again, forgive my pronunciation, put aside his prison clothes for the rest of his life and ate regularly at the king's table. So when we look at these two kings, Jehoiachin, excuse me, listened to Jeremiah, and he surrendered to the Babylonians. Zedekiah, who was his uncle, who, who actually was placed in power by Nebuchadnezzar, didn't surrender and had a very terrible ending. But to really understand that, we want to go back a little bit <clears throat> to the book of 2 Chronicles. And I'm just going to read a portion of, if you want to see the, the history outlined, uh, you can read chapters 34 through 36. Of course, I'm not going to read all of that, but I am going to just read from chapter 36, verses 11 through 16, which sort of describes Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart, and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations, and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So that's not a very nice indictment uh, for Zedekiah. Zedekiah was a son of Josiah, and he was the last king of Judah really to reign over an independent country. And he reigned for approximately 20 years. And he is one of the few kings of Judah that was actually succeeded by three of his sons, which should tell you that the time after Josiah was pretty uh, much a chaotic time that the power continued to shift back and forth. But Josiah, of course, followed the ways of the Lord, and Jeremiah held him in high regard. And you can find uh, about Josiah in, in the book of Second Chronicles as well. And Josiah, at the end of his reign, engaged the king of Egypt, Necho, in a battle, and he died. And after his death, his son Joaz was placed on the throne, but he only reigned three months. Because King Necho, like most kings, wanted to ensure that people that were supposed to be under their control stayed under their control. So he took Joaz captive to Egypt. And then he placed another son of Josiah on the throne, Jehoiakim. And he had a very bad reputation. Jeremiah gives a very scathing rebuke of him in chapter 25 through 26 of the book of Jeremiah. But he basically persecuted the prophets uh, without much mercy, and he also continued to switch his loyalties, depending on who he thought was winning this power struggle. Of course, at that time, historically, there's a power struggle going on between Babylon and Egypt to try and control this region. And we don't have time to outline all of that, but uh, Jehoiakim originally was loyal to Egypt, of course. They're the ones that placed him in the throne. After Egypt lost the battle, they decided maybe we should switch our loyalties to Babylon. So he did. But then for whatever reason, he decides to switch his loyalties back to Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, doesn't take kindly to this, so he sends his army to deal and crush Jehoiakim. And fortunately for him, he died before the army actually arrived in Jerusalem. And this leaves his son, Jehoiachin, who had only been king for a few months, to decide what to do. Do I follow in my father's footsteps? Do I want to engage the most powerful army of the world? Actually, he showed a great deal of wisdom. He listened to Jeremiah and decided the best thing for me to do is to surrender. So he does. He then is taken captive to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, who again follows the pattern of that time of history where he decides he'll put someone on the throne 
who was going to be loyal to Kim, another son of Josiah, Zedekiah, who was Jehokachin's uncle. And so he starts his reign. And this is the background of how Jeremiah spent his career preaching the word of the Lord, a very unpopular message most of the time. And in chapter 24 of Joshua, when we go back in time, before the Israelites even uh, had really established themselves as a nation, Joshua has now replaced Moses as the leader. And in chapter 24, he points out how God has fulfilled every promise and delivered the Israelites from slavery and all the great things that he promised. Not one of them did he fail to do. And in a book that... Uh, my daughter gave me to read. Irwin Ice Jr. wrote a book called The Beautiful Community. And in that book, he has a very interesting quote where he says, the Lord's pattern is to demonstrate his love through his saving power and then calling the people to obedience. And Joshua points this out to them in chapter 24. And chapter 24, verse 15 is that famous verse, which of course you see in plaques everywhere, where it says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And of course, the people respond, we're all in. We've seen everything God's done. We know that we're God's people, and we're just all in. But Joshua predicts something different. He basically says, no, you won't. He's holy, and he's demonstrated his love by his saving power. And he calls us to demonstrate our love by obeying him. Now, this is my paraphrase. You won't find those, those words in chapter 24. But really, Jesus says the same thing. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. We have Jesus talking about how he loves us as the Father has loved him. And he goes on to say that he remains in the Father's love. And he calls us to do the same thing. John chapter 15, verse 10, talks about if we obey <clears throat> His commands, we remain his as love, just as he's obeyed the Father and remained in his love. And then he even gives us another promise, starting down in verse 11, that then that joy, our joy, will be complete. But Joshua was right on in predicting the people would not be faithful. They would not choose God's way. They would continue to choose their way. And history bears that out. And again, from the book, uh, A Beautiful Community by Erwin Ice Jr. It's a little bit longer quote than I normally like to read, but I'm, I'm going to read it because I think he does such a nice job in summarizing jo Jeremiah's dilemma and what God was calling people to do. This is what he says in his book. By the time we reach Jeremiah's day, the consequences of the people's rejection of the Lord had begun to take fruit. And that ripped at Jeremiah's heart, bringing him to tears. You can find that in Jeremiah chapter 9. He is the prophet appointed by God to usher in the nation of Judah to exile. The Lord sent him to root up, to tear down, and to destroy and devastate. But it doesn't end there. It was also the prophet who was there to build and to plant. And Jeremiah 31, I want to read for you because that summarizes that part of Jeremiah's uh, ministry. Starting at verse 31, in chapter 31. The days are coming, declare the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they all will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And this is quoted verbatim, basically, in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, where we're talking about that new covenant is so much better. But Erwin Ice goes on to say that since a loving fellowship with God 
or lack thereof has ethical implications for how we live. Jeremiah characterizes a nation's lack of knowing God by their greed for unjust gain. There's an intimate connection between their behavior and their knowledge of God, specifically as it relates to their violating the, excuse me, the Ten Commandments. Jeremiah stands at the entrance of the temple and asks, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after their gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered only to go on doing these abominations? Jeremiah 7, 9 through 10. Well, obviously, that's not what God intended. God intended for us to reflect his image in the way we live. And as we look about how do we go about reflecting that image, again, a speech given by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This was given back on July 4th, 1965, at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, the American Dream. And Erwin Ice quotes portion of that in his book about this whole concept of the image of God. And this is from the speech. The image of God is the idea that all men have something within them that God has injected. Not that they all have sustained unity with God, but that every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God. And this gives him a uniqueness. It gives him a worth. It gives him a dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man from a treble white to a bass black is significant on God's keyboard, precisely because every man is made in the image of God. And one day we'll learn that. We'll know that one day God has made us to live together as brothers and to respect the dignity and worth of every man. And that powerful speech really captures that call on our lives to reflect the image of God and how we live. Going back to Zedekiah, how did it end for him? Chapter 52, it doesn't end very well for, for Zedekiah. He tried to escape, but he was captured. And he was brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, who had no sympathy for him. He was forced to watch the slaughter of all his sons. And then he had his eyes gouged out and was taken captive to Babylon. What about Jehoiachin, who's been in Babylon? And according to chapter 52, he's actually been there for 52, not 52 years, chapter 52, 37 years of the exile he spent in captive. But remember, he listened to Jeremiah and he surrendered. So he has his life. And it's kind of interesting, at the very end of the book of Jeremiah, and I'm going to just read that, starting at verse 31. This is chapter 52. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehokachin, the king of Judah, in that year, Mardo became the king of Babylon. And on the 27th, excuse me, the 25th day of the 12th month, he released Jehokachin, king of Judah, and freed him from prison. He spoke kindly to him. He gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So, Jehokachin put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regular at the king's table. Day by day, the king of Babylon gave Jehokachin a regular allowance as long as he lived until the day of his death. It didn't start well for him, but it ended well for him. And we don't know a lot about what happened in those 37 years. But I'm speculating that during those 37 years of being a prisoner, he became humble before God because he had listened to Jeremiah. And because he became humble before God, and again, this is total speculation on my part, it ends very well for him. Now, does that mean life is going to be easy for you when you humble yourself, when you live out your calling to reflect God's image by the choices you make? No, not necessarily. There's a lot of faithful people who end up being martyred. You can find many of them recorded right in the New Testament. But the point is, Jesus never gives up on us. And he never gives up on having that intimate, loving relationship and fellowship with us. And he never gives up on us answering that calling he's placed on us to reflect his image to the world, who desperately needs to see Christ in us, so that they can be drawn to Jesus, who has the only answer to all the problems that we often wring our hands over that are taking place in this world.
But we can do something about that. We can do something about that by taking seriously the call to reflect the image of Christ in the way we live. You join me in prayer. Father, thank you for the calling, the calling to reflect your image. Now empower us by your Holy Spirit so that choice by choice we will reflect your image in each choice we make. In Jesus' name, amen.